cruel women with whip-like smiles. Hutchins took up space in his customary seat in the back corner of the bar for quite a while before he saw the woman come in. Sitting in that particular spot allowed him to see everyone coming and going. A few moments before her entrance, Hutchins was about ready to call it a night. The smoke in the club seemed a little too thick. The alcohol had gone to his head, making him tired rather than exuberant. The house band's rendition of, Kind of Blue, seemed to drone on endlessly and the trumpeter sounded like Miles Davis if Miles had chosen to play the trumpet with his ass. When the woman came in the door, alone, there was one of those unique pauses in everything. Even the music seemed to stop for a few seconds. All the old. Clichés were resurrected, ringing with a new truth. Every man watched her because they wanted to be with her. Every woman watched her because they wanted to be her. What it came down to, he supposed, was rape and envy. She took a seat, by herself, at the far end of the bar. What life it had rushed back into the club. Hushed conversations of girlfriends chastising their boyfriends inevitably blossomed even though the women knew perfectly well why their boyfriends were staring. But Hutchins didn't have to hear any of that tonight. He didn't have to look into angry eyes, the anger only a thin coating over the jealousy, that wounded jealousy that was somehow worse than the anger. No, none of that tonight. Tonight he was alone. He lit a cigarette and stared at the woman. She sat sideways on the barstool, her legs crossed beneath an above-the-knee jade dress. Nothing fancy. It didn't have to be. She held her drink in her left hand and watched the band intently. He found himself admiring every touch, her jet-black hair pulled back and swept off her neck, her red lips, her black choker and black fingernails and the pale white skin coming out of the dress like smoke. For once, he was glad this was one of the most well-lighted clubs in town. The band finally finished its number and the woman put her glass down to clap quietly. As she clapped, her lips drew back into what she may have thought was a smile. But there was something about the smile, something insincere and mocking, something that demonstrated how an object of true beauty can never really appreciate what is beneath it. That's when Hutchins realized he had to approach her. These cruel women with whip-like smiles were exactly the type of women he went for. Actually, they were the only ones he could approach. There was apparently something weak and motherless about him, for these women said yes much more than he would ever have thought likely, undoubtedly realizing their sadistic control would be appreciated. And when they said no, well, it was to be expected and he didn't feel any less about himself. Hutchins teetered toward the woman and sat rather gracelessly on the empty stool beside her. It was enough to put him in the range of her scent, which was also flawless. It was somehow very dark and clean and exotic, if that were possible. When he turned to look at her, he noticed that she was already looking at him and he almost lost his nerve. He wasn't a lying kind of guy and all women, even cruel women with whip-like smiles, made him nervous. He said the first thing that popped into his head, I'm a chronic masturbator. She didn't laugh, only smiled that enticing half-smile. She looked at him for a long time, the way a man looks at a woman when he thinks she doesn't see him, before speaking. I'm not much of a conversationalist either. I think we both know why you came over. Would you like to see where I live? Maybe we can do something about your problem. Before he could answer, she noiselessly slid off the stool and headed for the front door. He followed, bathing in the scent unfurling behind her. He followed her out into the welcome cool of the parking lot. Would you like to follow me, she said. Sure, he said and went to get in his own car. As he slid into his car he saw her pull around in a small black Mercedes. All that and money, too, he thought. Staying as close behind her as possible, he followed her out into the countryside. She managed to go 10 to 20 miles over the speed limit the entire time. Within the confines of his small Chevrolet, its lawnmower engine wheezing and groaning, he felt like she had to be having a lot easier time than he was. 
They sped around twists and turns, up and down small hills, out into the low, flat country where the huge plantation houses were scattered sparsely, set back off the road. With one of these illuminated, monolithic structures looming in the distance, the woman slowed down and turned onto a blacktop driveway. I should just drive on, he thought. I have to be in way over my head. Suddenly, he felt like a mouse in the hands of a sadistic cat. A large, luminescent fountain bubbled in front of the house, the moonlight sparkling over the black water. The woman pulled her car around the arch in the driveway and he pulled in after her. The woman got out of her car and, without acknowledging him in the least, went straight to her front door. He followed her through the cavernous, darkened house and into her kitchen. She grabbed two wine glasses and a bottle and continued with her strident pace. He almost wanted to call, hey, wait up. The word, agenda, came to mind and he started to wonder what hers was. Maybe she had found out her husband was having an affair and this was her way of making up for it. Other things crossed his mind. Or maybe, he thought. Maybe she's just like you and this is all she wants. Just one night that neither party will remember two well years in the future. Maybe, he thought. She led him through the house and out the back doors. Once outside they were in a huge garden, the like of which he had never seen before. Back there was another fountain, this one smaller, in the middle of the garden. There were also a number of statues, almost enough to be gaudy, arranged sporadically throughout the garden, a small underlight illuminating each one of them. There were men and women in various poses and they reminded him of the sculptures of Roman gods. The woman split off the cobblestone walkway and, kicking off her shoes, sat down on a mat of depressed ornamental grass. She looked up at him before he sat down, her mouth twisting into that malicious little smirk and there was a look in her eyes that told him exactly what she wanted. Following her lead, he kicked off his shoes, peeled off his socks, and took a seat next to her. Do you drink wine? she asked. Yeah. You know, I'm not real picky. If you were, you wouldn't have a problem with this at all. I could tell you that it was Roland 1946, but you wouldn't know what that was, would you? No. I definitely wouldn't. Stuff's a little out of my price range, he said, immediately feeling kind of dumb. Well, then let it be a mystery to you. She picked the bottle up and held it, her large eyes running up and down the length. I need to go back in and get the corkscrew. I always forget the corkscrew. It sounded filthy, the way she said, corkscrew. She stood up and moved back into the house. He picked up the bottle. It contained no label or anything hinting at its contents. Well, this is it, he thought. She's brought me here to poison me. But he couldn't see how that would benefit her at all. Then she would just have a dead body on her hands. The woman came bouncing back out with her hands full. She sat back down across from him, childishly crisscrossing her legs. Would you like to do the honors? She handed him the corkscrew. He went to work on opening the bottle. What's your name, by the way, she asked. Oh, Elliot. Yours? Magdalena. That's beautiful. That's trite. But thanks. The cork came out with a small pop. He smelled the opening and was surprised at the sweetness of it. He had lied when he told her he would drink anything. He hated wine almost as much as he hated champagne. This is a nice place you have here. Thanks. You state the obvious really well. Are you married? She laughed. Of course. Why? Does it matter? Besides, why do you ask? He couldn't really give an answer. He didn't mind at all. As he approached middle age, he found married women to be the most abundant. Because you don't know any rich women. A woman can't have a nice house and drive a nice car if she's not married. No. 
I only asked because you seem pretty forthright. Yeah, I guess. Is he coming home soon? Let me give you a quick lesson about the female psyche, Elliot. Women want fucked as much as men. Maybe more, sometimes. A man could probably get off by rubbing up against a tree but it's not that easy for a woman. We ache. And the ache is way up inside and it has to be teased, coaxed, or simply beaten out. Only then do we get release. We may be a little pickier than men but the longing, believe me, is still there. The only difference is that a woman doesn't have to work to get fucked. We can, just go to a bar and sit down. Exactly. Unless she's married. Then she gets to fuck when the husband wants to fuck. Again, her mouth formed that derisive smirk. Here, hold this. She handed him one of the wine glasses and filled it full. Shall we toast? he asked. Two. To fucking, he said. And the night, she finished. They clicked glasses and quickly polished off the first round. Magdalena was right. She wasn't much of a conversationalist. They sat in relative silence and drank a couple more glasses of wine. He found it quite agreeable. He sprawled out in the grass and looked up at the fat moon, listened to the night birds call out to each other from their separate cells of isolation, watched the slow flapping of the trees and the unmoving grandeur of those statues. Startling him, Magdalena sprang to her feet and said, Catch me if you can, and took off running through the garden. Hutchins, battling with his alcohol-soaked body, struggled to his feet and trudged in the direction she had gone although he could no longer see her. Slowly, he stepped his pace up to a slow trot and jogged around the flowers and shrubs, undoubtedly trampling some of them. Once he got about halfway around the perimeter of the garden, he stopped, winded. Magdalena, he called. Some feeling other than drunkenness settled into his bones. Now he thought for sure the wine had to be spiked or poisoned or adulterated in some fashion or the other. The whole garden brightened somewhat, became somehow richer, like all the green seemed to stand out, painting itself over a black, foggy canvas. Magdalena, he called again. Shit, he thought, what the hell kind of game is she playing? After thinking that, he saw something like a path open up, a green, liquid path. It wound around a series of small yew trees and disappeared behind the huge magnolia. Now he started to feel a dual sensation. His skin and viscera felt light, his hair stood up all over his body, shivers down the spine, like it was all trying to crawl away from him. But from the middle of his body, his lower stomach spreading down to his sex, he felt a heavy thickening. This animal desire combined with a revelatory high gave him renewed zeal in seeking out Magdalena. He was going to give her what they both came here for. Relishing in the intensity surrounding him, he slowly started down the path floating through the garden like an ethereal river. Visions ripped through his mind. He made no effort to try and force them out. The red raging fires of hell gave way to a group of sweaty, naked primitives, background drums beating as they coupled with wild ferocity. He saw a shimmering blue church and heard, from within the church and somewhere very far away, the slow chanting of Ave Maria. A whip came down on a sublimely porcelain and feminine back, lighting a red gash. Lightning ripped through a dark sky. Waves pounded a black coast. He saw dripping, hairless vaginas and throbbing, ejaculating cocks. He could smell lilac, the mighty river, the sultry air of the gulf and somewhere, even farther away, the scent of Magdalena. He crept behind the magnolia and saw her there, standing still. She took off running through the dew-slicked grass, back toward the house. Determined not to lose her this time, those visions still raging through his head, those feelings still surging through his body, he chased after her. She splashed through the fountain and threw herself down in the grass on the other side of the walk, her dress sliding back on her thighs. Hutchins landed on her, 
shoving that dress up above her waist and taking down his pants and underwear with one motion. The only thing he could think about was tearing her apart. He forced her legs open and moved up inside of her moistness. Magdalena grunted hungrily as he thrust up into her. She ripped his shirt off and bit his chest. He moved one hand under her ass and the other behind her head, moving it around to the neckline of her dress, yanking it down and meeting her breasts. Lasting only a few short minutes, he experienced everything, heard the wet grind of their skin, the soft and rhythmic rasps in her throat, felt the pumping of her blood around him. He shivered to a climax and rolled off beside her. They lay there for a few moments, breathing heavily. Would you follow me anywhere? Magdalena asked. Yes, he replied. Will you follow me inside? Yes. But maybe dreams were just starting to mix with reality because he didn't really remember saying anything at all and after they had this exchange they both still lay there. He felt too heavy to move. It felt like he was sinking into the soft mat of grass and he couldn't imagine her house, however accommodating it looked, being more comfortable than that patch of grass under that moon with that thick night air washing over his skin. Then he watched as Magdalena stood up and sloughed off the scrap of green dress. She reached down for him from somewhere impossibly far away and he felt his hand in hers and his body slowly rising to its feet. She kept her arm behind her, leading him along. He looked at her exposed backside, the red marks from his rough hands smudged along her back and buttocks. She led him back to their original spread. Her hands were all over him, pressing one of his arms down to his side and crossing his other arm between his chest and his stomach. Magdalena got down on her knees before him and closed her mouth around his cock. He looked down at her and she returned his stare. Her eyes were green and vibrant. Was that the first time he had noticed her eyes were green? She took her mouth away and said, I love to taste myself, before going back to her suckling. He felt his sex stiffen again. He looked up at the sky and then back down. She held a cup, wine remnants sloshing around the bottom, and pulled her mouth away just before he came into the liquid. Magdalena stood up and held the cup to his mouth. Would you like to taste yourself, she whispered into his ear, her hot breath running down his spine. He wanted to object, knock the cup away or something, but he couldn't move. She put the cup to his lips and tilted it up. He felt the warm liquid slide down his throat and hit his stomach and then felt like he had to be sleeping because he couldn't move and everything was black. Slowly, the blackness of night gave way to the gray dawn. A cacophony of birds unleashed itself upon the garden. He thought he must have gone to sleep out there and tried to roll over, half expecting to see Magdalena still sleeping beside him, but he couldn't move. He looked around the garden, verdant and dripping with life. He looked at the statues, the well-built men and women, dark gray with the night's dew. They were full of life, too, weren't they? He asked himself. A sickening dread hardened the inside of his body when he realized his fate. Time was not a factor. For days, weeks maybe, he drifted in and out of consciousness. Every now and then Magdalena came into the garden, sometimes to sketch, sometimes just to take her morning coffee, sometimes to take a lover and drink wine, the last thing Hutchins had tasted, mingled with the last bit of life he had. Other times, she brought patrons out to the garden, told them lies about the statues. Sometimes the patrons offered her vulgar amounts of money for them. Smirking with the knowledge that she had things people wanted, Magdalena sent them away disappointed. Sometimes she would stand in front of the statues, staring up at them. It was at these times he wanted to be free, but only so he could once again feel Magdalena's skin in his hands and lose himself in that whip-like smile and those clover eyes. Next story. The smoke of Samuel decayed leaves dropping from a tree, the memories swirl back into the autumn of her mind as she sits thinking. She slowly surveys the room. It truly is picturesque in its decay. 
Easels burdened with blank gray canvases surround the middle of the room like dark monks preparing for seance. Stacks of books, magazines, photos, and old drawings are limp heaps in the corners. Two stark gray filing cabinets are locked against the wall to her left. The walls are bare, absent of pictures, no life clinging to them. Dust is the only substance that clings to anything. Dirt dust, incense dust, dead cancer cigarette dust. Dust is death, she thinks, we rise and fall into dust. After nearly a week, they had finally moved all their stuff into the sizable but dilapidating house. Samuel Bean, secretly tortured artist and alleged master of mayhem, disturbance, and vandalism at Raven Creek High School was finally settling down at the ripe old age of twenty. Married to the former Gina Blanc, aspiring dancer and general wallflower of Raven Creek High School, they made a good couple. She appealed to Samuel's quiet, artistic side, while responding well to his exuberant energy in bed. Most of Samuel's stuff had been haphazardly sorted into the upstairs studio. His boxes of books covered the vast wooden floor, canvas-burdened easel standing erect on its surface. He left the middle of the studio open so Gina could practice her dance. Samuel enjoyed watching her. He enjoyed watching her thin, well-defined muscles rippling beneath tights or, sometimes, nothing at all. She seemed to float around the room. The silent beauty of a butterfly pleasing his eyes and sinking further into his heart. After they had been there for a few months and were somewhat practiced about coexisting with one another, Samuel decided to sit down and begin painting again. He was mad to get back to it. The art had been eating away at him. Once he began painting he felt somewhat out of practice. It seemed that everything he started ended up looking like something else or something that resembled excrement. Searching for a reason, he came across the only explanation he could think of. The pain was gone. All of his works had been driven by pain. Pain and ugliness. Gray death, black suns. There was no happiness inside of Samuel Bean. A testament to Samuel's artistic rendering of pain was Gina's refusal when he had asked to paint her naked. I'm sorry, Samuel. I really mean no offense. You just well, you have a way of making things look, uh, ugly. She quickly reached out to catch his plummeting ego, I'm not saying it's not good. It's brilliant, it really is. It's beautiful in its own way but I really just don't want my feelings to be hurt. Samuel, looking at things objectively, understood what she meant. He still argued to do it, mainly because he thought it would be a huge turn-on, but she was unwavering in her stance. Gina's observations had been something that Samuel had lived with ever since he had started showing his paintings to her. Continually, it popped up in criticisms of his work, if it was a criticism at all. Samuel had never really stopped to figure out why his art was so ugly. To him, it was the only thing he knew, what he'd been raised with. Samuel had grown up, most of his young life, in Louisville. The worst parts of Louisville. The parts that nobody ever thinks of when they think of Kentucky because pictures of the slums and the factories didn't make it into the travel brochures. There were no horses for miles and you'd have to walk through an ocean of concrete to get to the nearest mountain. His family had moved to Raven Creek at the beginning of his freshman year. Raven Creek was a small town where everyone had pretty much the same income, but Samuel seemed to bear the stigma of living in the absolute worst house in it. The feeling of being the only poor person in town was coupled and tripled with the facts that he was not athletically inclined in the least and he was relatively bright. During high school, he was the daily subject of beatings, taunting, and general disdain directed in his favor. He was once shoved into a ditch and called nigger, even though his skin was quite pale. Samuel guessed that the fine rednecks of Raven Creek, KY, population 512, had never even seen a black person outside of the television, which made the KKK carvings in the school desks pretty much irrelevant. He became involved with Gina his junior year, 
bringing her into his dull realm of pain. Her first taste of that, other than the rumors, was reaped when he had tied her up. Before him, nobody even knew who she was. With him, she enjoyed wide fame under such names as, poor white trash, bitch, slut, whore, freak, as well as many others that were much less pertinent to either her gender or socioeconomic status. So, after graduation, Samuel and Gina moved as far away from picturesque Little Raven Creek as they could while still remaining in the beautiful Blue Mountains of Kentucky. Still traipsing in the midst of his funk and wallowing in self-pity, Samuel sat himself in front of the only window in his studio. In the midst of a gray morning, through the window, across the river behind their house, Samuel found his muse. His ugly, decaying, wasted muse. A river mill of some sort that had slowly devolved into an industrial wasteland unveiled itself in all its desolate grandeur. Positioned between two objects of sheer beauty, the river and the lush green hills drifting steeply upward to meet the sky, the mill sat like Satan ready to be cast out of heaven. Lifeless smokestacks rose, brown brick streaked with black stains, to probe the surrounding magnificence. The mill seemed immense in its horizontal gray-brown-black structure, a line of shattered windows sitting on top of its X-shaped steel supports. It looked like someone was trying to smudge it out of existence. This is it. Samuel thought, excitedly grabbing his sketch pad that had sat beside him ever since his slump began. He didn't know where to start. It was all so voluptuously ugly. Once started, Samuel realized he wouldn't be able to quit until it was finished. At first, Gina brought him coffee and ran to the discount tobacco store to get him Samporna clove cigarettes, happy to see him working on his ugly art again. Then her visits became less frequent, punctuated with grumbling complaints. His body, which should have been aching with unnoticed nicotine, caffeine, and general sustenance withdrawal was fueled by the painting. Eventually, Gina would only come up to practice her dance and, without speaking to him, storm out of the studio, slamming the door. When too tired to stand up or move his arms, Samuel collapsed onto the floor, waking to the developing painting before him. A beard burst through the smooth skin of his face. New smells from various areas on his body reached his nose. He was thankful there was a toilet on the same floor. When it was light, he could not stop staring at the vast industry, trying to capture in detail every last trace of ugliness. By no means was it a photorealist piece, but there was some nuance forever jumping out at him. Something he had to incorporate somehow. When it was dark, he couldn't stop thinking about it while he applied layer after layer of thick oils. The scenes that must have been played out there. The horrors that no doubt lurked in the minds of some of the extinct employees. The pain that seemed to surround the mill, envelop it in bleeding red. The stink of those who had, for whatever period of time, become machines or parts of the machine, fighting to keep themselves and their families alive. Eventually, Samuel reached a point that would have been called finished if it would have been any other subject, but there was something he felt was missing. It wasn't one single thing. It was the feeling, the mood. His painting just didn't seem to encompass everything. Maybe, Samuel thought, the shading needs altered. He covered other miscellaneous canvases with various shades of gray. He mixed every degree of black and white, trying to achieve the perfect value and failing each time. Samuel fell to merely sitting in front of the window and staring at the damn thing. What the hell was it? What could he not reach out and grasp with his mind? What, dear fucking Watson, was missing? What detail? What one little thing? No, it wasn't any single aspect, it was an aura. Not a single facet, it couldn't be given a term, it was simply something all-encompassing that would make the entire thing work. Yes, but what was that aura, that feel, that mood? Finally, it hit Samuel. The inside. He'd never seen the inside of any factory or mill. Maybe the interior was the final veil of sadness. 
maybe it was the clarity of a tear, cutting through the years of dust. Even though he wasn't painting the inside, he felt as though that would be the key. Samuel was certain, certain that all the answers to his consternation lie inside the sadness beast, the breeder of pain and death. Maybe the workers, the people who ran the dead blemish were the devil and they had been cast out. Quickly, Samuel Bean formed a mental game plan. Tonight, he would rest. Tomorrow morning he would wake up and go to the mill to snoop around and get inside if he possibly could. Samuel slept. The first night he had even resigned himself to a full night of sleep and he was plagued with a single dream, he's almost done but he can't get off the floor. Why won't his body move? Deep blazing fire climbing the walls throwing violent light on the circle of easels shifting into hooded druidic specters moving closer and closer to him horrible chants exiting their bodies through the dim openings in their cloaks like a bunch of dead air a song of dead air a symphony of morose sepulchral breath moving closer and closer so slow but never ceasing no hope of ceasing and the fire not spreading but becoming more alive. And violent eating walls eating souls making those insane. Visionary easel monks more acute more pronounced as they advance and slowly pulling back their cloaks revealing what is inside so ambiguous so bright like the sun at noon on the summer solstice not even seeing everything in front of him and not even seeing what. He screams what is it? What? And then the sound of being sucked through a void and thrust into that comfortably dark room. Samuel spent the rest of the night in a very welcome, very deep, undisturbed sleep. The next morning Samuel went into the bathroom to shave and take a shower. It felt like a great cleansing to remove his black beard, wash the grease and dust from his long dark hair, and peel back the second skin of grime that had formed over him. Pulling his hair back into a ponytail and donning some clean clothes, he went downstairs feeling fresh and new. The morning was bright and crisp. Gina greeted him with a fresh pot of coffee and a hot breakfast of sausage and gravy and eggs in the sun-washed kitchen. The first cigarette of the day was strong. Good morning, Gina said, eagerly setting the table in one of Samuel's flannel button-down shirts and her simple white underwear. Good morning, honey. Breakfast smells great. Are you finished with the painting? she asked. Almost, Gina baby. Almost. He went on to explain his plans about going into the mill. When can I see it? Soon. I promise. Soon. I don't know how long it'll take me to put the finishing touches on it but I know, I know it's almost there. Gina noticed the fire dancing in his eyes. It was a fire she had not seen in a very long time. As the water and razor had cleansed his outside, she knew the fire was doing the same to his insides. Samuel devoured the breakfast. It filled him up fast. He ate it all, regardless. After slurping down some milk to nourish his aching calcium-deprived bones, he stood up and said, Well, I'm going to the mill. Wait a second and I'll come with you, Gina said, already walking toward the bedroom to fetch some pants. No, honey, I'd rather go alone. A look of hurt pride flooded her sparkling blue eyes. No offense. It's just, well, since I feel kind of close to the painting, I'd rather go alone. I won't be gone long. Promise. I just want to poke around on the inside some, that's all. Okay. I understand. Samuel admired her deep reservation. He quickly kissed her on the cheek and left. Samuel stared at the padlocked garage-type door with growing anger. He picked up a couple of large rocks and hurled them at the rusty iron. There was no way he was going to get this far and then be locked out of the one thing that had become his life for nearly a month. The front of the mill dropped off into the river, making the broken windows there impossible to enter. The back of it was stuck into the mountain. Swearing under his breath, he continued to hurl stones at the unfeeling steel. Why won't you let me in, he shouted and then thought, Christ, I'm acting as if this thing were human. A voice shouted from behind him, Hey! 
Samuel turned, half expecting to see a wonderful peace officer standing there with his little shiny badge in his little blue suit. Instead, it was a slight man in dirty navy-colored coveralls, supporting himself against the handle of a wide broom. Hey, he repeated, moving closer to Samuel, his right hand swishing the broom forward while the other hand braced his back as he crept along in the gravel. Ye you will want in there. The man was very close to Samuel now. Samuel noticed that his left eye blinked rapidly open and closed while his right eye stared forward, occasionally shooting off to catch some movement in the woods beside them. I guess I want in there almost more than anything, right now, Samuel told the man. Ha ha who are you, the man stuttered. Samuel Bean, he said, extending his hand. And you? Ku Kentmer, he spat out, switching the broom to his left hand and holding out his right. Ha who Su sent you? Both eyes were now open wide, boring into Samuel. Who sent me? What do you mean? Samuel asked and then realized that he didn't want to wait through the man stammering out an explanation. Well, nobody, I guess. I'm doing a painting. Just decided to come down and check it out. So, you can get me in. Sure can, Kentmer spat out and began walking outrageously slow toward the padlock door. Samuel followed him, anxiety like lighter fluid on the flames of his anger. After what seemed like an hour, Mur finally reached the door. He leaned his broom against the dirty brick of the outside, hunched down, and seized the lock in shaky hands. After several attempts at trying to line the key up with the slit in the lock, Samuel grabbed the tiny key ring with this one single key on it and pushed it in. Mur began stammering as Samuel jiggled the key around until he heard a click. Lou live uh, up yonder in the de woods, Samuel pulled the heavy door up. She died in there, Mur said with no stammer. Still in there, he added, deftly seizing the key from the lock and moving away. When Samuel turned to watch him go, Mur was already a few yards away. Da don't forget to close up, the man called from over his shoulder, raising his right hand in a wave of departure. Fucking nut, Samuel muttered before entering the factory. Inside seemed impossibly cold. Inside seemed impossibly damp. Inside seemed impossibly dark and dirty. Samuel decided he preferred the outside, but his fascination and curiosity pushed him farther in. Samuel, having felt as clean as a newborn less than an hour before, automatically felt grimy and dirty. Shattered bricks, cinders, and shredded shingling littered the floor with copious amounts of animal excrement dropped from various dwellers of the dark. Spider webs clung to every possible corner. There didn't seem to be any opening anywhere. Samuel began to feel very claustrophobic even though the inside of this manufactured manufacturing beast was huge. The darkness and filth were oppressive. She died in there. Samuel mused the words of Kentmer. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Who died in here? Careful, man, you'll spook yourself out. Try not to think about it. Think of Gina. Sweet Gina. She died in there. Still in there. What the hell? Who? Samuel pulled a tiny toy-like flashlight, the only thing he'd had, from his pocket and shuffled deeper into the darkness. His beam of light fell on rows of antiquated machines of mass production. They were set in rows. He marveled at the exact design of each row and how every machine in that row looked the same. They'd even aged the same way, the spiders spinning their overtly similar webs, the bats shitting the same piles of shit in the same exact spots. And he moved along the ends of these rows, not wanting to get in between the machines, afraid they may start up and devour him. Samuel was drinking the darkness, the clotted textures, moving farther and farther back into the old factory. Something caught his eye. A light. Farther back in the factory a light was on. Samuel paused. It wasn't fear really. 
he had to devise a plan for he was certain about proceeding to the very place that light was on. Probably, he reasoned, it was just something the creepy Kentmer had concocted because an old factory wasn't really abandoned if there were still lights on in it, was it? Maybe it served as some sort of makeshift hideout for a group of kids or some bums that had grown tired of riding the rails. Samuel figured he would just stick to the truth. He was a painter. He had to know what this place looked like on the inside. Kentmer had let him in. No harm to anyone. He would just turn and walk away. As he drew closer to the light, he had no real use for his weak flashlight. It was a fluorescent light and he saw now that it was coming from a room. What he'd seen from way back there was just the doorway. The door wasn't even open. All that light was pouring from the window of the door. Samuel could see flowers on the wall in there. The closer he got the more clearly he could see but the scene got farther from his understanding. He'd never seen anything like it so he had to put it together piece by piece. Okay. It had once been somebody's office but it was now devoid of any real office qualities except for the huge wooden desk in the middle of the floor. A naked body adorned the surface of the desk. Flowers were scattered all over the floor, climbing the walls, outlining the body on the desk. Samuel opened the door, greeted with the scent of the flowers. It smelled like walking in the hills after a spring rain. Samuel stared at the figure, a beautiful female figure. She was young and quite voluptuous in her nudity, though lifeless. He noticed her eyes, large, gray, staring into the bright fluorescent above the desk. Her skin was smooth and gray, but so beautiful, so many shades and values. Her hair was jet black, cascading in soft rolling waves over her shoulders. My daughter, a voice said from the darkness behind Samuel. His heart pounded. He froze with confusion and, yes, now fear. Being in the bright room had caused him to lose whatever night vision he'd gained and the darkest of dark greeted him as he turned to face the voice. Samuel placed the voice as Kent Murs. Murs stepped into the bright light and Samuel realized that he was much thinner and paler than he had at first thought. From behind his back Murr pulled a bouquet of red roses that the lighting turned nearly violet. He picked up the oldest-looking bouquet of flowers at the foot of the body, pulled them up to discard them on the floor, and put the new bouquet in their place. The prettiest things grow wild up there. In the hills. They're all very beautiful. Samuel made it a point to stay at least arm's length from Murr. Samuel realized that Mer no longer stuttered and his eyes were perfectly normal, sedately hooded at that. He couldn't help looking away from Mer to drink in the sight of the body on the desk. She's not dead, Mer said, placing a hand on her foot. Touch her. You'll see. Samuel reached out and touched her forearm. Although she wasn't as warm as a living human body, she wasn't completely without temperature and her skin felt very pliant, like one of the petals on the flowers surrounding her. Unbelievable, Samuel whispered. Why is she in here? Oh, she was dead once. When I found her. She can't go out in the real world. A slight moan escaped the body. A very low, sensuous moan. Her eyes blinked once. Sometimes she gets hungry. Mur unbuttoned the cuff of his right coverall. The wrist was purple, mangled and scarred. With his left hand, Mur pulled a small knife from his pocket and made a very surface incision on his wrist. He let the blood drip over her lips and chin before lowering his wrist and letting her hungrily suckle. When he pulled his wrist away, her tongue snaked down over her chin, licking it clean, leaving it glistening with her saliva. I know what you thought. Out there, he motioned toward the front of the factory. You thought I was the village idiot. Hopefully everyone does. When Linda was alive, I was the proudest father in the world. Mr. Bean, you don't know how much I loved Linda. No, it was nothing sick. I wanted all the best for her and was able to provide it. 
I wish I could have done more. She always came to me with all of her problems. I listened attentively, trying to offer suggestions. Just trying to help. Then I began to fool myself when she stopped coming to me. She's too young to have serious problems, I told myself. There's nothing wrong. She's just growing up. It was all lies. Still, I don't know what pulsed inside her brain. I don't know what happened to her. What led to her death? Mur walked around behind the desk. Tears rolled silently down his cheeks. My daughter, he stroked her hair with his hand. Exactly as I found her. I had to rob her grave to put her back, but she's still beautiful. Samuel knew that Mur was trying his best to sound casual and poetic even though the tremor in his voice was threatening to throw him into incomprehensible sobs. I ran this place. I owned this place. She was only seventeen. I don't know why she was down here. I don't know if I really want to know. But one or more of those vile mindless beasts that sold their lives to this stinking death hole murdered her. Maybe she did ask for it. Maybe she was that kind of girl. She was never easy. But this. Nothing justifies this. Awkward under standard social interactions, Samuel was entirely without words. I'm sorry, Murr said, breaking down. Is this, is this what you wanted to know? This is, uh, more tragic than anything I could have ever imagined. I'm very sorry. Samuel extended his hand and entwined his fingers with Murr's thin and trembling fingers over Linda's body. Not only was Samuel no longer afraid of Murr, he wanted him to feel every bit of sympathy he was able to give. Well, Murr began. I suppose you got things you gotta get back to. Samuel took his cue to leave. Thank you for letting me in, Mr. Murr, Samuel said and left. Once outside, Samuel felt drained and sensuously dirty. He started home toward Gina, wanting only one thing, beautiful, seventeen-year-old, dead Linda Murr. Gina greeted Samuel at the door, practically yanking him inside. After shutting the door, she quickly unfastened his pants and had them down to his knees. Her hands were all over him, her lips, her tongue, and nothing was happening. Samuel's mind was back in the industry. The face of Linda Murr as she licked her father's blood from her lips. So beautiful in her death. She was death. She was darkness. She was loneliness. She was the muse. And by the time Samuel started getting excited, Gina was frustrated. I need to finish the painting, Samuel said. It's been almost a month she was nearly crying. We haven't even been married a year and you've already stopped fucking me. In his studio, Samuel couldn't concentrate enough to paint. He was planning his next visit to the industry where the heart of the painting, alive in death, breathed and throbbed beneath the surface of his fingertips. Samuel spent the next few hours smoking cigarette after cigarette, gazing between his now lifeless canvas and the dark expanse out his window, listening to Gina bang from room to room in the house, slamming every door as violently hard as possible. Eventually she burst through the door to the studio. She stalked toward him so fast he nearly fell out of his chair. She had suitcases in her hands. You call this working? She walked over to the painting. Yeah, that's beautiful. Really fucking brilliant. I can't even tell what the fuck it is. That must mean it's really good, huh? Wait, though, it needs something. She coughed and spit onto the painting. She was crying, shaking, near hysterical with anger. I'm going to stay with my parents for a while. Maybe you can call me when you grow a personality or a cock. Really, either one would do at this point. Then she stormed out, slamming the door hard enough to put a crack down the middle of it. Samuel felt numb. He spent the rest of the evening drinking beer and Jack Daniels, winding up at the industry. This time the door wasn't locked. 
No flashlight now and his mind was as dark and cloudy as the inside of this place. And he found himself at her altar, his hands running over that smooth skin, color rising in her cheeks as she pulled him to her, their lips meeting. Linda's hands were all over him and she tasted like the sweet decay of dead roses. Samuel gasped for breath as she pulled her lips away and slid them down his neck. Samuel couldn't open his eyes. He grew weaker with each breath he took. Feverishly, he continued to move his hands over her body, feeling the heat between her legs, the hardness of her ribs, the soft heft of her breasts, and the slow, increasingly strong beat of her heart. Sliding into darkness, Samuel heard her voice, seductive and cold, um I could get drunk off his blood. You bring the best flowers at night, daddy, and the last thing Samuel saw through the doors of light that were flying open in his mind was Gina's tear-streaked face. Gina and her father have finished loading all of her stuff into the moving van. She sticks a stick of Samuel's opium incense between the floorboards, lighting it and one of his clove cigarettes with the same match. She looks at his painting on an easel positioned in front of the window. She's never liked his paintings but when they first met he seemed to handle her with the same passion and care as he did those horrid canvases. As she looks out the window she sees the mill sitting like a cancer on the hill. Black smoke pours from one of the hideous brown smokestacks. That's odd, she thinks. She figures a homeless guy has probably found a furnace and started a fire in it. Gina, honey, it's all packed, her father calls up the stairway. Coming, dad, she calls back. Gina crushes the clove on the floor and leaves the incense burning as she crosses the room and closes the door on the smoke of Samuel. Next story. Sad Clown, Kentucky. 1. Moments of Clarity. A fleeting moment when everything makes sense. An instant when a decision is made. A life-altering decision. Charles Zasper had a moment like that. It wasn't the moment he found his mother dead. No, his moment of clarity, his epiphany, came later. But it couldn't have happened if his mother had not died. In fact, he would realize later, perhaps to relieve himself of any guilt he felt, that everything had to happen exactly the way it did for him to get where it was he was going. 2. Charles Zasper was not an extraordinary man and the circumstances that brought him to live with his mother were not extraordinary circumstances. In the life of Charles Zasper, things just happened. And, up to a point, they happened in an ordinary fashion. Charlie graduated from Ortown High School in southwestern Ohio with average grades. He selected an average community college to attend, planning on majoring in computer science when he finished his requirements. When he was 20, he met an average woman, although it took him a while to realize she was average. It was also when he was 20 that he dropped out of school and went to work in one of Ortown's many factories. It wasn't a spectacularly high-paying factory, for those did exist in Ortown. It was an average factory, a paper mill that made boxes for White Castle restaurants that paid average wages and had average benefits. Charlie and his wife, Nora, bought a house in one of Ortown's many average suburbs. There they ate, slept, fucked, argued, and talked about having kids. But Charlie had a low sperm count. Even they give a lackluster performance, he sometimes thought. When he was 25, Charlie and Nora went through an average divorce. They had simply grown tired of one another. The good days were no longer good enough to cancel out the bad ones. Charlie quit his job at the paper mill and moved in with his mother. Between his half of the divorce settlement that came from selling the house and splitting the money in half and his mother's social security, Charlie didn't figure he'd have to work again for a long time, if he lived modestly. Which was good, because mother was getting on in years and Charlie didn't really have any intention of ever working again. He didn't see the point in it. It felt like he was working for somebody else. Besides, mother needed somebody to look after her. Ever since Charlie's dad died when he was twelve, mother had been fiercely independent. 
But now it was nice to have someone go to the store for her, or make out the bills, or help with some of the more laborious upkeep of the house. Charlie was that person. It was something he didn't mind doing. He loved his mother and it was nice to spend time with her before she died. It was clear she was going to die soon. At least, it was clear to her. The beautiful place is calling my name, Charlie, she would say. He didn't really want to hear it. He didn't want to think about her dying but he knew it was inevitable. Charlie spent most of his time at Mother's house stoned during the day and drunk in the evening, watching television and reading books. Well, he had started out splicing his TV watching with reading but then he realized most of the books he had thought he enjoyed contained stuff he didn't really want to think about. The television was different, though. It didn't really matter what was on, Charlie watched it. Day after day, he sat frozen in front of the TV. Sometimes he laughed only to wonder, a couple of minutes later, what it was he was laughing at. Sometimes, whole days would pass and, when he went to bed at night, Charlie had no recollection of what happened that day. Well, he'd watch TV all day, of course. But what had he watched? He couldn't remember. The talking heads simply ate away his memory. So from the time he moved back in with mother until she died was really one long continuous days. 3. Mother died on March 23rd. Charlie knew she was dead when he went into the kitchen and saw that the coffee hadn't been made. Mother always made the coffee at 6.30 in the morning, just like she had when Charlie's dad was alive and Charlie was rushing off to elementary school. Without fail Charlie was greeted, every morning, with the aroma of mother's strong coffee. It was a welcome scent and the absence of it that morning stopped him cold. Hurriedly, he went about making the coffee himself, as though it could revive the dead. He knew it was hopeless, but it was like the whole house was lopsided and insane without that scent. Once the coffee was on, maybe he could think a little bit. Maybe it would get some of those cobwebs out of his head. While the coffee brewed, he crossed the house to mother's bedroom. The door was slightly ajar. It was always slightly ajar when she was in it. It came from pushing the door against the frame but not hard enough to make it click shut. The slight unevenness of the old house caused the door to creep back into her room. Mother was slightly cold to the touch. He watched her chest for any rising and falling. He checked her pulse. He held the back of his hand against her nose and mouth. Nothing. She was right, Charlie thought. She knew she was going to die. It was just a couple of nights ago she had warned Charlie about her black dreams, black cars, black curtains, black horses, and black seas. Shadow children calling from outside her window, wanting her to come out and play. And now the blackness had settled over her. It had drowned her and it wasn't going to cough her back up. Charlie went to call the hospital and then decided not to. Maybe he should have some coffee first. Smoke some pot to calm his nerves. Pick up the house a little bit. Mother would hate anyone being in the house when it looked the way it did. Later that evening, Charlie went to the phone again. This time he figured he'd better call the police but, picking up the phone, he couldn't do it. He was too drunk and high to handle the house being filled with cops and paramedics. He went back into his mother's room. It felt colder than the rest of the house. Outside, the March winds rampaged, slinging icy rain against the window. Charlie pulled the quilt, something his mother had made herself, up to her chin. He sat down on the edge of the bed, put his face in his hands, and cried. For some reason, he couldn't see her as completely dead until she was in the ground. He imagined her spirit stuck in some kind of middle ground, trying to reach her beautiful place. He hoped she could find it. He didn't want to leave her side. Not that night anyway. He went to her nightstand and rummaged until he found the only two books she ever read. One was the Bible and the other was a beat-up historical romance paperback. Alternating, 
he read her passages from both of them. There were times when it felt awkward, reading the romance passages to his mother, but it was better than trying to think of something to say. Sometime just before dawn, Charlie got tired. He put the books on the nightstand, kissed his mother on the forehead and, pulling her door tightly shut, he went out into the living room to fall asleep in front of the television. He wouldn't open her door again for nearly a month. 4. He woke up the next afternoon and contemplated calling someone about mother again. Before he even got up to go to the phone, Charlie realized that an interesting sort of paranoid paralysis now crawled through his veins. If he called someone, wouldn't they know how long his mother had been dead? And wouldn't they find it peculiar he hadn't called them yesterday, as soon as he found her? Wouldn't it be considered gross abuse of a corpse or something? Christ, he didn't want to go to jail. Eventually, Charlie settled down into a fogged routine. Every day, he tried to forget he was ignoring the fact that something had to be done about mother. He woke up, made the coffee and took a daily trip to Habsburg's corner store to buy wine and cigarettes. At first, he just bought one bottle of wine but then he found himself going for three and then four. He smoked five packs of cigarettes a day. All day, he sat on the couch in front of the television, ripped on wine and laughing like a madman, a cigarette always burning between his fingers. The morning after he woke up with headaches and a persistent cough, wondering why he felt that way and proceeding to do the same things over. He didn't turn on any light save the flickering glow of the TV. He didn't open any blinds. He couldn't recall eating anything. For nearly a month and it really felt much longer, it felt like the only life he knew, Charlie lived like this. 5. It wasn't until a day in late April that Charlie had his epiphany. Actually, it was like several small epiphanies leading up to one huge revelation. The day began like any other day. He woke up. He made his coffee, took the pot into the living room with him and sat in front of the television. Shortly after noon, he went to Habsburg's. This time he just needed wine. There was still a half a carton of Lucky Strikes back at the house so he wouldn't need any more for at least a day. He jingled the door open at Habsburg's and went along his predestined route, staring down at the tiles peeling back on the yellow water-stained floor. Charlie always wondered how it was the health department never managed to close Habsburg's down. Charlie liked it because it was convenient, but he didn't think he would ever buy any food from there. But it was all right for wine and Charlie loaded up his arms, carrying the bottles to the front counter. As always, old Habsburg was there. Charlie had never figured out his first name. Charlie also realized he never made eye contact with old Habsburg. Usually, the transaction took place with Charlie staring at his chest until the old man held out his gnarled hand to give him change. Today, however, Charlie looked up at old Habsburg. What he saw made him stumble back a couple of steps, only far enough to where he could loop his arms out and seize the wine bottles. It looked like Habsburg had aged to the point of death. His once ruddy complexion was now a chalky gray. His wrinkles had become trench-like furrows cutting through that pallor. And his eyes, when Charlie met them, were a milky white. Thank you, Habsburg said before his eyes turned black, some type of fetid pus rolling out and onto his cheeks, diverted by the wrinkles around his mouth. Charlie was speechless. Not bothering to reach out for the change, he pulled the bottles in close and charged out the door, his heart beating harder than it had in a long time. He didn't slow down until he was at the corner and across the street. What the hell? He thought. Once across the street, he slowed down. On one hand, Charlie was terrified. On the other hand, he felt more alive than he had in years. Adrenaline sparkled through him. His skin felt hot against his clothes. His heart leaped around in his chest. All around him it was a nice day. The electricity of spring held on. Overhead, a bruised mass of clouds floated rapidly across the sky but, here and there, 
he could catch the blue behind the clouds and it was magnificent. Charlie paused at the next corner, looking around at the blooming trees and the early stages of the neighborhood's gardens. He breathed in the air, a rare fresh and clean scent for Oretown. It was only clean, he figured, because it came from some other place. He imagined the flat farmlands of Indiana. Off to his right, he saw a woman ambling from a few yards away. She pushed a baby carriage and it looked like she had on a short skirt. Charlie found himself vaguely aroused. He had forgotten how good it felt to be in that state, even if it just meant going home and jerking off over the sink. The woman drew closer. She seemed, in fact, to be coming at a somewhat alarming rate. As she closed the distance between them, the terror Charlie felt back at Habsburg's came back. The woman was almost right on him now and he saw that she wasn't attractive at all. She was emaciated and deathly, tight brown mummified skin wrapped around her bones. Her hair hung in dirty strands and clumps. She smelled like decay. She stopped the carriage just in front of Charlie and turned to look at him. Her eyes were black sockets. Yellow pus oozed from her blunted, truncated nose. She put up a hand to one withered breast and lasciviously rolled her green tongue out to Charlie. Forgetting himself, he bent over the baby carriage to vomit. Inside was a stillborn, its purple body drawn up, an umbilical cord ascending to who knew where. Charlie let go with the puke, wanting only to be away, and felt the baby's sinister soft stroking of his cheek. Charlie upright himself and took off running. He was only a couple of blocks from home. Ducking off into an alleyway between two shops, he pulled to a panting stop. Christ, he felt like he was dying. Looking up at the sky, he saw the sun desperately trying to break free from those heavy clouds, lining their contours with a glaring white gold. What the hell are you trying to do to me, he shouted. He didn't know if he was yelling at God or Mother or his whole sad life. What the fuck am I supposed to do? The amazing thing was that he felt capable of doing something, anything. He pulled a wine bottle out from his jacket. Rearing back his arm he threw it as high up in the air as he could, aiming it right at the clouds. He heard it pop on one of the roofs. Charlie imagined his blood spewing from the shattered dark green glass. Why don't you let the sun go, you little shits? He threw the second bottle. She could burn you up if she wanted to. Charlie threw the third and then the fourth before he took off running back toward the house, chasing down the cloud shadows racing along the asphalt. 6. Once back at the house, Charlie realized he didn't want to go in. He thought it would be too much like walking willfully back into a coma. The inside of that house was a dense fog of twisted, half-remembered memories. Bracing himself, he opened the door, went in, and turned on all the lights. The place looked like a war zone. He was amazed he was able to wreak so much havoc in so short a time. Indescribable stains covered the floor, creating a sticky sheen. More stains were splashed upon the wall. A dank, heavy odor took his breath. Pizza boxes and junk food wrappers surrounded the coffee table and couch, some of them containing a decomposing mass of the original contents. The coffee table was covered in ash and cigarette stubs. A pile of empty wine bottles mounted itself against the back of the couch. Christ, Charlie muttered. It was at that point he knew what he had to do. He had to get out of Oretown. To stay there was a slow death. But there were other things he had to do first. Things that would free up his mind. First, he had to stop and think, where was he going to go? He went around behind the easy chair in the living room and grabbed his dad's old Rand McNally Road Atlas. It was still there. It was amazing how little certain things changed over the years. Trying not to look around him, he took the Atlas out onto the cement front porch and sat down on the top step. Age had turned the pages of the atlas yellow and crinkly. It carried a musty scent the fresh, damp air seemed to exorcise. 
Charlie didn't know where to look first. He lit a cigarette and started at the beginning, reading the names of towns and cities in each state. Some of them he spoke half aloud, rolling them around in his mouth to see how he liked the sound. He sat there for over an hour, hardly moving, letting those names and the abstracted topography of America silence the voices screaming up from his viscera. By the time he reached the end, he had it narrowed down to two places. Going by the names alone, he figured it had to be either nothing, Arizona, or Sad Clown, Kentucky. Practicality dictated that it would be Sad Clown, Kentucky. Charlie didn't think the car would make it all the way to Arizona and it was just his luck that it would break down in some place called Centerville or Middletown. Some generic, prefabricated place too much like Ortown. Another Ortown, regardless of how far away, would still be Ortown in the end. No, Charlie had lived his entire life in Ortown, experienced life and marriage and death in Ortown. Charlie was finished with this Ortown and all the other Ortowns in the world. His mind made up, he tossed the atlas off to one side of the porch and walked around the house to the garage. He pulled the door open and let the smell of the garage hit him, a smell he'd always found unpleasant. It was like gas and rubber and antiseptic cement with a layer of unidentifiable grime. No matter how clean it was, it always smelled that way. Charlie sidled past the car, not knowing why they even bothered putting it in a garage, and made his way to his mother's gardening tools. Beside the table covered in flower pots and old dried bulbs, Charlie found the items he was looking for. There was a small, motorized tiller and a shovel. He grabbed them up and went back to the house. Before going inside, he looked around to make sure no one saw him carrying these instruments into the house. Later, when the authorities found the house abandoned, Charlie didn't want one of the neighbors to say, well, come to think of it, last time I seen him he was going into the house with a shovel and a tiller. That could breed suspicion and Charlie didn't figure it would take people too long to start thinking maybe he had killed his mother. That wouldn't be fair to either one of them. Charlie didn't want an exhumation to disturb his mother's resting place. 7. Trekking through the wreck of the house, Charlie eventually reached the basement door and skillfully maneuvered both instruments down the stairs. The floor down there was hard-packed dirt, greasy with age and a virtual lack of sunlight or organic activity. There were the narrow, rectangular windows on three sides of the house, but they were so grimed over that any sun coming through was pale and sickly. Charlie knew he would have to use the tiller to break the initial layer and figured he could probably get down three, maybe even four feet before hitting bedrock. It proved to be a lot more difficult than Charlie had at first suspected. Digging it took him up until nearly dawn. The old dirt had covered his sweaty skin and he felt like he wore a coat of mud. His palms were blistered and bleeding. The bottom of his right foot throbbed from coming down again and again on the metal lip of the shovel. Once he stopped, he didn't think he'd be able to raise his arms above his chest without wincing. But he wasn't tired. Not once during the whole night had he felt like going to sleep. He stood back and surveyed his work, wondering, is it a grave if there's nobody in it, or is it just a hole? Sticking the shovel in the pile of loose dirt he dug up, Charlie went upstairs and out onto the porch to take a breather. He pulled a cigarette from his breast pocket and lit it, resisting the temptation to sit down on the steps. If he did that, he knew he'd stiffen up and be unable to go back to work. Because, of course, only half of his work was done. But he didn't really think of it in those terms. This next part was ritual, ceremony, something he should enjoy doing. It was going to be another mild day. At this hour, the sun merely burned the horizon gold. Low, thick gray clouds rolled slowly overhead. Last night had been a full moon, or close to it, and Charlie felt as much surrounded by twilight as dawn. Off in the distance, a factory billowed its white steam. Muffled by the morning moisture, a train horn sounded, dragging its sad cargo along the cold rails. 
The world had not woke up yet and Charlie stood there, still, feeling like the possessor of some secret knowledge. Flicking his cigarette out into the yard, he went back into the house. Still trying not to look around him, he went to his mother's room and turned the knob of her door. Bracing himself against the fetid smell, he swung it inward and then his breath got caught up in the back of his throat. His throat closed up and his heart hammered against his breastbone, his mother, crouching in the corner, stood up, moving too rapidly, brushed the wrinkles out of her dress and came toward him. She made a hideous kissing gesture with her mouth and said, through windpipes riddled with decay, I'm not there yet, Charlie. I ain't made it to the beautiful place. And he smelled her rose perfume covering up that fecal urine reek and closed his eyes, waiting to feel her cold cold hands on his cheeks only, he didn't feel them at all. Pressing himself against the doorframe and trembling, Charlie opened his eyes. There, on the bed, just as he'd left her save for looking a little more dead, lay his mother. Jesus, Charlie said aloud, putting a shaky hand to his chest and waiting for his heart to stop trying to explode. He thought about going into the kitchen to get some wine until he remembered he didn't have any. Charlie crossed over to the bed and thought, well, I guess I have to do this. This was the part he dreaded most and he found himself questioning the reality of it. The whole thing just didn't seem like something he ever saw himself doing. It felt like he had become someone else, living some other life. The smell of death hung around his mother. There was some familiarity in the stink. Charlie had smelled it when they went to visit his great-grandmother in the rest home. He had smelled it in hospitals. It was like the body gone bad turning like milk or meat or fruit. There wasn't any other way to think about it. Charlie went around the bed, undoing the four corners and tossing them toward the middle. Gathering quilt and sheet around mother, Charlie bent down and heaved her up, slinging her over his shoulder. There was a sickening crack as his mother met his shoulder with some stiffness before her torso went limp and draped over his back. If it weren't for having to focus on some level of physicality, that sound and that feel would have made Charlie nauseous. Cautiously, he crept through the living room and down the stairs as they creaked beneath the added weight. Once in the basement, Charlie hurried to the hole and, as tenderly as he possibly could, turned the hole into a grave. He climbed down in the grave with her. The mounds of dirt were well over his head and he felt instantly claustrophobic. As though he was going to be buried in there with her. He figured he had managed to go a good three and a half to four feet deep with the grave. Charlie bent down and made sure the sheet or quilt covered all areas of her body. It would seem too disrespectful to just throw the dirt right on her. He scrambled out of the hole before panic attacked him. He stood there, looking down at her and feeling like something was missing. Mother was not the most religious of persons but Charlie felt like some type of prayer was in order only he didn't know any prayers. Suddenly, he ran upstairs and grabbed the two books out of her room. He dropped the romance in there with her and said, in case the beautiful place has a restroom. Then he flipped around the Bible until he found Psalm 23. Nervously, he read it aloud over her grave, not fully understanding it and not entirely sure he wanted to. With that, he closed the Bible up and delicately lowered it into the grave until it rested against Mother's still heart. God bless you, Mom. You deserve so much better than this. And just before he threw the first shovelful of dirt on top of her, a streak of sunlight came through one of the basement windows, impossibly bright, and shone across the dirt floor and across his mother's brightly colored quilt. Not pausing, he went about hurriedly shoveling the dirt onto her, trying to capture as much of the sunlight as possible in the dirt before the sun went away. By noon, Charlie finished placing the last of the dirt and packing it down. The sun had long since fled the window. Charlie thought about marking mother's grave somehow. He thought about putting her name or something like, here lies the sun, or, she rests in the beautiful place, but it seemed too risky. He didn't want any potential owners to know someone was buried down here. He settled on a cross, 
two very thin lines made with the tip of the shovel, and figured that would have to do. If anybody actually happened to notice that, they'd just think it was one of those spooky religious coincidences. Charlie breathed a long sigh of exhausted relief. He picked up his instruments and headed back out toward the garage, careful to shut the basement door behind him. Braving the kitchen, he crossed over to the sink and, from the cabinets below it, found the jar where he had put all the money from mother's social security checks. He cradled that in his left arm, added the half carton of cigarettes from the top of the refrigerator, snatched the car keys from the small brass hook in the wall and started out for the car, bending on the porch to pick up the atlas.